Okay, good. Right, greetings. Uh, thank you very much for coming along. And this is the final lecture in the series. Um, so we've, the basic idea of this has been of law reform, of looking at it as a law reform concept, um, which means that we look at where the law is now, we look at the, what it's achieved, uh, how far it's got, but also look at the drawbacks and the limitations. So like any good law reform analysis. Then we've looked at the idea of whether it could be different, the principles behind it, and then, of course, move on to its links with potential links with human rights, uh, and then the last few weeks, looking at what's actually happening at the moment in animal rights law, both in terms of case law and in terms of possible drafting, whether it could be a possible treaty or national legislation. What we're doing in this last lecture, which is a little bit shorter so we can have a longer discussion afterwards, what we're doing in this last lecture is considering the context of animal rights law uh, and the implications, um, and particularly the extent to which um, it might, uh, how it might become law. In other words, whether the law reform might decide uh, and be, uh, decide that animal rights law was a realistic thing. Bearing in mind, of course, that as you saw in contrast to animal welfare law, um, the change, a shift to animal rights law would be huge, and one of the most significant shifts in economic and social life for centuries. A fundamental change to the way we view animals uh, as property. And you remember this from the animal welfare and the contrast to animal welfare where essentially what one's talking about there is continuing with the existing property uh, ownership control paradigm um, but tightening the elements of it. And as, we've, as you've seen, animal rights law is a fundamental shift and a fundamental challenge to that paradigm. So we're going to look at three areas that we think may be relevant. First is the idea of, of animal rights being a social justice movement. Secondly, if it is a social justice movement, how does it fit, how does it connect to other social justice movements? And then thirdly, how could animal rights win hearts and minds? In other words, what sort of issues are being discussed in animal rights um, that could make it um, uh, be appealing to the general public um, or unattractive? Um, obviously, the idea of it being a social justice movement may seem somewhat strange in the sense that we think of social justice as involving people. Um, and the essence, of course, is going to be whether the animals are appropriate subjects for justice. In other words, in a sense, this is fundamental to it. Are animals going to be considered appropriate for justice? Um, and not just receiving, but as subjects of it. Um, and if they are going to be subjects of justice, then we have to decide how they're going to be treated. Are they going to have a value equal to humans, like Tom Reagan's view? Um, or are, they going to be, um, are we going to be committed to treating like interests in a comparable fashion? So not identical, but an equal consideration of interest. So that's what it would mean to be a social justice movement. Um, and our view, and the assumption we're taking here, is that animal rights can be seen as a social justice movement. Now, if that's so, then we can start saying, well, how does it fit with other social justice movements? And as some of you may be familiar already, um, there is uh, quite a lot of literature and quite a lot of reflection on the extent to which animal rights um, could link up with other, other um, social justice movements, particularly anti-racism uh, and feminism. Um, and once you do that, you realize there's quite a number of interesting points of intersection, of common ground. So the idea of powerlessness, the idea of domination and oppression, um, these, the idea of the powerful against the weak seem to be a common thread. Um, the use of violence and the use of force to perpetuate that position. Um, and of course, justifying the status quo. Um, the idea of tradition, the idea of cultural values, the idea of religious values. These seem to be common um, to other social justice movements. Um, and a number of authors have been even more robust in finding a connection, a link. Um, so this is Jones, the, a clear case of the intersection between speciesism, racism, classism, and environmental justice coming together in this modern industrialized 
agriculture. So very, very clear idea there that there's really no, no question about it. Um, other authors have made the same sort of point that, um, that, that <laughs> the idea of a broader feminism that uh, incorporates other life behind it besides human beings. Um, the idea of interconnectedness. All oppressions are interconnected. I'm going to come on to this again in a moment. Uh, and the idea that no one creature will be free until all are free. So the idea of a very strong horizontal bond, I think, comes across clearly. So in other words, animals aren't just in the same mix as social justice. They're actually connected to it directly because they've got the same themes. Um, and the same question exists for women as for animals. Are they like men? And all through much of the course, we've talked about the idea of, of establishing uh, a criteria for animals to be considered for rights. And we've talked about the idea of them being like humans, the idea of being, you know, to what extent are they showing human-like attributes. Um, animals don't exist for humans any more than women, more than women exist for men. Why should animals have to measure up to human standards for humanity? before their existence counts. Uh, some very powerful articles. These are all on the reading list, um, if you're interested in reading, if you're interested in having a look. So very, very strong response here. Uh, and then, of course, connections which you probably come across between femi feminism and vegetarianism, meat-eating and masculinity. There's some interesting papers on, on those sort of links. Um, and the links between the oppression of women and the oppression of animals. Uh, Carol, um, Carol Adams book. Um, but of course, some of you, again, may be aware, it goes further. In other words, we're not just seeing common elements in the different uh, social justice movements. We're seeing, a, suggest, there's a suggestion, there's a common cause. In other words, these common elements are common because they're linked. Um, an intersection that racism, sexism, classism, speciesism are all part of the same general picture, the same structures of patriarchy. Uh, male domination and male violence. So in other words, you've got this, this pyramid, if you like, linking them not simply horizontally with the same characteristics, but vertically up to the same central point. Um, so again, uh, Kepler, the idea that we shouldn't be compartmentalizing these things, we should be keeping, um, uh, we shouldn't be looking at the objects of them, because then we're looking at the identities of the victims. Whereas we should be looking at the different oppressions and they intersect in the same place. In the hands of those whose interests are being served by all forms of oppression. So this is the idea, the top of the pyramid. These are all intersecting at that point. Um, the elites and corporations of principally white, western, capitalist, educated, adult men. So again, the suggestion is not simply that there's commonality but there's a common intersection. And therefore, um, these are all linked and we can't simply focus on one rather than another. Um, and, and to see it as simply oppression um, is, is to miss this for what he calls, what they call the formidable power pyramid, a mega power system of interlocking forms of oppression. And this comes through in a number of, a number of authors, the suggestion that one simply cannot... Uh, consider these things in isolation, because if you do, um, the, 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 common, the, the uh, strength and the potential of these social justice movements simply cannot progress while there's oppression left behind. Um, equally, of course, uh, when animal rights fits, uh, works uh, alongside other social justice movements, there is the argument that uh, animal rights needs to be aware of some of, these, uh, some of these links and some of these overlaps. Um, so uh, Manisha Decker here, the idea that, you, that the animal rights movement at times has used uh, uh, feminist uh, slurs or, or racist slurs to try and make their point. Again, on the reading list, some, some interesting articles um, about what's being done and the extent to which uh, the animal rights movement should think of itself as part of uh, as having linkages with these other movements and therefore shouldn't be doing things um, which are, uh, if you like, perhaps in conflict with those. Um, 
Equally, the issue of universalism, which of course is a fundamental element we saw from human rights. Um, it's a fundamental tenet of human rights law that humans are the same, um, and, and with other social justice movements, but again, got a problem of universalism uh, for animal rights. Um, are all animals going to get the same rights? And we're going to look at this again um, in a few minutes. Um, so, the idea of the connection between the different social justice movements is suggested, as I say, not simply to be a potential or an opportunity or a, a matter of uh, uh, noticing the, the, the similarities. The suggestion is it goes much further. The suggestion is that these are all connected and therefore, like the hydra, um, you, you can't simply chop off one head. You, you have to chop off them. If um, animal rights is to uh, have popular appeal, if as a, as a law reform concept it is to get support of governments and uh, civil society and the general public, um, then it's going to have to start facing up to some of the challenges I mentioned at the beginning, of course, the biggest challenge is that there's a paradigm busting going on. That the animal welfare isn't simply working with, within the existing paradigm of ownership and control. And uh, whereas welfare is able to progress simply by tightening the, tightening the regulations, um, it's arguable that animal rights um, has to face up to a bigger challenge. Um, there's an interesting article um, about uh, uh, Peter, uh, Peter's use of uh, ethical treatment of animals, um, Peter's use of uh, Holocaust, uh, Holocaust narrative and racist narratives to try and support their case. And there's some interesting articles in your reading list discussing this and saying, well, maybe um, these usages of racist and, and uh, Holocaust uh, imagery are not inappropriate because of the challenge facing the animal rights movement. Um, I haven't covered it, I, I'm not going to cover it here, but again, just as a sort of side issue, um, we've often in the past, and I think suspect you may well have had as well, have uh, used the word abolitionist in relation to animal rights. Uh, and there's some interesting things, again, in your reading list you might want to look at and the idea of whether being an abolitionist um, has created too much of a sort of binary dialogue that abolitionism uh, carries with it some very clearly defined uh, objectives that perhaps will make uh, animal rights harder to bring in. But again, you may want to have a look at some of the reading. So what are the sort of issues that animal rights may have to face if as a law reform uh, uh, theme um, it is to achieve uh, any progress. Um, first of all, there's one we've touched on before, and this is the idea of the, this is the, idea of the elite. Um, and we've, we've talked about this with things like the, uh, the cases brought by the Non-Human Rights Project, um, the, uh, you know, the elephants, the, the uh, great apes, and so on, the chimpanzees. Um, and the suggestion from McKinnon that, that women having rights has actually benefited only a limited, limited sector, a limited group. Um, done precious little to change the abuse that is inflicted on women daily. And this idea that animal rights are likely to benefit first a tiny elite rather than animals in general is an interesting one. As I say, we've touched on it. Is it better from a, a strategic or a tactical point of view to simply approach the question, look, we think... Uh, we think we can get uh, a successful habeas corpus for this particular animal or this you know, represent this particular species, or is, um, uh, but at the same time, it means we're essentially ignoring the much bigger populations of other species that are in much worse conditions um, uh, you know, outside zoos and particularly in factory farming. So there's an interesting question, I think, which we touched on, whether this, whether the sort of approaches being made at the moment are in danger um, of benefiting only an elite group. Now, of course, the argument 
the counter-argument that someone like Stephen Wise would make would be to say, well, look, let's get what we can. Um, there's a case here we may be able to win. Let's try and win it. And if we do, it breaks down the wall um, and opens things up um, for other species. But it's an interesting one. Um, and and the, related, the related point, this idea of the narrow categories, um, the domesticated animals, a few zoo animals. Again, in your reading, you'll come across quite a few examples of, uh, uh, where we're focusing on, say, domesticated, domesticated animals. So David Favors' book that came out a few months ago almost entirely focuses on what he calls rights uh, for domesticated dogs. And he acknowledged that in his book, but he also says, um, yes, obviously, there's a lot of other animal species out there that are treated far worse than domesticated dogs, but that's for another time. So I think, I think he recognises that all his ideas of self-ownership and, uh, and ownership in trust and fourth class of rights or a fourth class of property, all of these things, I think he accepts, um, maybe it's easier to establish and recognise in relation to something like uh, domesticated animals, dogs and cats, than it is you know, for the much, much larger, um, much less well-treated category of farmed animals. Um, so, as I say, the argument they make is, well, we can, you know, this will start the progress. Um, but, of course, from a tactical point of view, one needs to decide whether these are actually um, pathfinders. In other words, are these, are these actually setting the, setting the path um, or um, are, are they actually outliers um, and could, it, could things actually slow down? Um, could one get into a situation where you simply cannot... Um, extend the sort of principles um, to other, other species. Okay. Um, so, of course, talked a minute, a little while ago, about universalism, um, so the idea of equality and all being treated the same. The, the problem, problem is the idea of, I call it, what rights which species and, and obviously it's something you'll have been thinking about. Um, that is the issue of how do you grant, um, how do you differentiate between animals? Do you differentiate, and if so, how? Um, do you grant rights according to species? Do different species of animal have different rights? Um, or do you group species together by sentience or intelligence or awareness or whatever? Um, and in which case, we, <coughs> you can imagine the legislation would be about saying, well, this group of animals, this group of species, have these rights. And this second group of species has these other rights, probably lesser rights. And perhaps this third group of species has very few rights at all. It's a genuine problem because uh, the undeniable, the unavoidable difference between different species means you have to decide how to allocate rights. Um, an alternative, uh, which some people prefer, is the idea that all animals have the same rights. Now, obviously, the advantage of that is that you're not having to decide what sort of capacity a species has got. You're not having to allocate them into different categories. Um, but, of course, you still have to, uh, there still has to be some, some mechanism to recognize that different animals have different capacities and, therefore, different needs to rise, need for rights. So it could be that what you go for is instead um, the, same category, the same rights for all, but then you focus on focus on their capacity. The problem with that group, of course, as you can, that approach, of course, as you can imagine, is that in terms of public acceptability, it's probably going to get me a much harder thing to do because you'll then be saying to people, yes, all animals have the same rights. And, and I don't know, but you probably have the same sort of discussion I have where people say, well, you know, do you mean rats are going to have the same rights? And you sort of go, well, yeah. Uh, and then you, you, you end up going off on a side issue. 
If anyone's found a good answer to that, by the way, please, please let us know. So the idea of what, what species, what rights, is going to be important, not only in terms of public acceptability, public understanding, but also in terms of progress. How are you going to do it? And that's why you go back to the idea of the elite species and go, well, look, at least we're on fairly safe ground. You know, we've got this elephant and we can describe it and we can describe its emotional and its, its family links and its need for company and all those things. We can describe this chimpanzee, we can talk about its DNA, we can, we can talk about its physical appearance and we can talk about its capacities. So we're on fairly safe ground there. So you can see why it's quite appealing. Um, we talked about rights and welfare as being quite different. Um, as you know, uh, uh, Raphael and I haven't, don't suggest that these are in opposition to each other um, at all. Uh, and you remember the, talk, the, the, the lecture on the idea of new welfare, new welfareism. Um, the idea that in, in the short term you are focusing on improving the quality of life animals, um, uh, but in the long term you're aiming towards rights. Um, another one which I, I drew from human rights, the idea of progressive realization. In other words, the idea that doesn't matter what that, that uh, what's ideal is is out there in the future, but it's about taking steps towards it. And progressive realization um, is the idea that you can make progress, providing it's progress towards that goal. Then it's something worth doing. Again, it may be a way of recognizing change. Um, that some of you who've read uh, Franzioni's uh, material will be aware that um, Franzioni's got some quite harsh views um, about, about how that works. Um, and, and finally, and I just sort of picked this one before we, um, before, before we break, um, this is, a, a, again, a, an approach. We talked, I talked about Peter earlier on and concentration camps and holocaust and so on. Um, there's all sorts of views on this. To what extent should the animal rights movement uh, movements, should they be using shock in their pictures or should they be using constructive language? How do you go about uh, uh, encouraging the idea of change? How do you, and there's been a number of criticisms of animal rights for not using evidence and data from existing conditions for animals um, as a basis um, of, of, of encouraging change. In other words, part of law reform, to go back to the beginning, part of law reform is to argue that the law may need reforming because these are the current conditions which the existing law allows to prevail. So until there's a clear understanding of existing conditions, it's hard for the public to feel um, that there's anything uh, that needs change. Anyway, so what we were doing, what I really we just want to do in this last lecture is to take all the law you've done and move it uh, into the context of how might law reform come about, um, the extent to which the animal rights movement is cohesive and the extent to which it's, it's, it's um, uh, contradictory or internally conflicting, the extent to which animal rights is next to animal welfare and perhaps a new welfareist, you know, it's, it's a continuation of animal welfare. Um, I was at a conference last week and they, they kept talking about animal protection. So they didn't use words like welfare and rights, they talked about protection. And this is supposed to be a, a, a word that the public are more comfortable with um, than, than talking about rights um, or even welfare. <coughs> so to, to what extent does that sort of narrative need to change? Um, and the extent to which the animal rights movement, although if you take, a, say, a sort of Franzioni approach, approach it's, it's essentially quite a binary narrative. In other words, you're either doing it or you're not. You're vegan and you don't and you own animals, or you're not and you fall outside. To what extent is there a binary story, and to what extent is there a journey that animal rights can make um, towards progressive uh, realization? And there we go. I'm going to stop that, and we will have discussion.